which is light and darkness. Help us in this moment to see what it is you intend, how we are to understand, what new gifts we can receive through our reading and our study of this passage. We ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. So as you listen to the scripture lesson this morning, what are some of the things that immediately jump out at you? I know it's 8.30 in the morning, and I know this is a real struggle, but for a moment, switch on the old brain power and think about what you just heard. Yeah, Les. He had disciples. Jesus had disciples already. Before his ministry started. Before his ministry started. It, John is very, he, he, he shares this story oddly, different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in that there is no gathering of disciples. They just seem to kind of, they're there. So I don't know what that says about his disciples. He knew them before he actually called them to come and follow them. That's a possibility. Did you hear anything else that was really interesting? He yeah. told his mother not to tell him what to do. <laughs> uh, Herb, I don't think he's talking about you, but I mean, you may need to have a discussion with that boy in the car on the way home. Yeah, yeah that, isn't that interesting? There's a relationship between mom and son here that is kind of laid out a little bit differently than the nativity story and even differently than uh, the passage we looked at last week, which was Jesus in the temple at approximately 12 years old. There is a budding relationship here uh, that, that is kind of curious. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Anything else you noticed that was really kind of interesting or a curiosity or, or a moment where your head kind of snapped up and said, what the heck is that about? Nothing. Is this passage so familiar that there's nothing? The, the transformation of the word to the lion was the best. Yeah. There's something going on there that doesn't make a lot of sense when you first listen. I mean, the idea that Jesus could turn water into wine doesn't particularly disturb us. But why at a wedding feast? I mean, I've been to a lot of wedding feasts. I think that would be really cool at a wedding feast. Although, even the, the steward of the event kind of goes, this is like backwards. You know, when everybody's, what's, what's the right word? Sober. That's when you hand out the really expensive wine. So everybody goes, wow, they went all out for this wedding reception. You then, after they are no longer sober, uh, hand out anything else. Because at that point, they can't tell what it is anyway. They're no longer connoisseurs of what you're offering. This, uh, this steward realizes something crazy is going on, but he doesn't do something else. I, he, goes, he goes and finds the, the bridegroom. And, and he says to him, how did you do this? And there's no recording of what the bridegroom said. I mean, I, I would think the bridegroom would have said, what are you talking about? There's no more wine. It's all gone. There should be something else that you notice. Where, where was the wine? The big vats that they were washing their hands in. Yeah, the big water things. Because the, the tradition was, of course, that you didn't go to feasts like this without doing the ritual washings that required, at the minimum, foot washing. Their stone jars, which is interesting, they weren't like, uh, like pottery. Uh, I, and the reason for that is, is pottery, in order to use pottery, because it's, it's absorbent, there would have to be a whole blessing process of dealing with the water that you're putting in them. Stone ones were considered more sacred because the water couldn't somehow enter into the fabric of the, of the container. Uh, but uh, um, there, there's this curiosity about what this is all about. John thinks this is really cool and that this somehow indicates what's happening. And, and, and in a sense, he kind of gives us that first little piece about the relationships going on between Mary and Jesus and the disciples and kind of walks away from that and heads us into a new direction. He says, this is the first of Jesus' miracles. This is where things begin to start. But it begs the relationship between Jesus and Mary. I, I, I find it interesting that you haven't wondered about something else. How did she know he could do a miracle? Well, that might be one thing, yes. What, what was she really asking from him? Because she doesn't say, by the way, Jesus, go turn some water into wine. Um, I'm not even sure her expectation was that this would be a miracle. She just thought that her son should do something. Although, this raises the question of relationship between father and son. I also think it's interesting. Maybe this is just, you know, personal. <coughs> but there's no Joseph. 
Joseph isn't there. Um, and there's no suggestion Joseph, Joseph, Joseph should be there. Uh, and in fact, Joseph never comes into the story uh, again. Um, our surmise is that Joseph has died. And that in fact, um, this is now a unique relationship between Jesus and his mother. Although there is suggestions other places in scripture that there's other uh, family members, at least other brothers, if not other brothers and sisters. Um, but Joseph is gone. They've gone to a wedding feast. There is the oddity that Chris pointed out that in fact the disciples are at this wedding. There's no explanation about why they're there and how they got called or less pointed that out. Um, there, is, uh, there is also this unique relationship between Jesus and mother. Mary feels totally unabashed about deciding that this problem should be Jesus' problem. Um, and I don't know. People have tried to wonder about this. Uh, why Mary would take it into her heart that the lack of wine at the wedding was somehow a family issue. Maybe that suggests that in fact this wedding, the reason Jesus and Mary are at this wedding, is that, that this is a wedding feast of someone who is immediately related to them. You know, a niece or a nephew somehow to Mary. And that going there, they felt personal family, a familial responsibility for the wedding feast falling apart. Uh, know a little bit about big wedding feasts because my sister married a man who is uh, from New Delhi. Uh, normally, if the wedding had taken place in New Delhi, uh, the wedding reception would have gone on anywhere from three to five days. Uh, because of that tradition, you have to have massive amounts of food, you have to have massive amounts of beverage. Um, another really interesting little tidbit is that though we kind of think in our heads that wine was an everyday beverage in the Middle East, it was not. Most people who did not have uh, an extreme amount of money drank water, as scary as water could be, uh, because that was available. If you didn't drink water, you drank um, something else, but probably not wine, because wine was one of those things that was a, sell a saleable commodity. Uh, it was a cash crop. And so in general, if you had wine, you, uh, you, you know, if you had grapes, you made your wine, you sold it, you got the money, that's how you used to sustain your, your family life. Uh, you would only have wine if it was a huge celebration. And like the dowry, this was a time you see. But there is this relationship between Jesus and the mother that's hard to understand. And in fact, the idea that somehow Mary could go and find Jesus and say, by the way, son, this is our problem. We need to do something about it. Or more specifically, you need to do something about it really raises great questions. Of course, this is where uh, the beginning place where the Catholic Church um, cr creates the doctrine of, of Mary, that somehow Mary has intercessory powers with Jesus. And for most mothers and most sons, this, this makes a certain amount of sense. Mom always seems to have an extra bit of oomph with son. I don't know why that is. Mom can call upon and say you need to do. The lawn is not cut. Someone needs to cut it, and son knows what that means exactly. It means him. Um, and there is this, and so there's a suspicion that that's what's going on here, that somehow there is a unique relationship between Mary and son. And none of us is prepared to deny the suggestion that Mary's relationship to Jesus was absolutely unique. Uh, she knew him, she loved him, she seemed to understand him at a certain level. But we also have to compare that with other scriptures that suggest that at this very point, Jesus is beginning to move away into ministry in a way that will set the family a little bit off to the side uh, as he goes about the work he needs to do. The miracle takes place with no action by Jesus. He simply tells the servants to go fill the water tanks. And it's done. When they ladle out the water, it is wine. John explains that this is the sign of the new covenant. That new wine has arrived. The old wine has run out. The new wine has come into existence. And it becomes the beginning of what will be this new reality. The church of Jesus Christ. Need to play with it a little more. There's more there to mine and discover. But for right now, we're going to leave it at this place. Let's bow our heads. We thank you, O God, for the wonder of this gathering around the scripture, for the things that we can find here, discover here, wonder about here. 
We find the relationship between Mary and Jesus very much like our relationships here and now. And yet with that touch, that incarnational moment that reminds us that this Jesus is uniquely the Son of God. We pray that as we continue to learn, as we are challenged by your word, that we might find ourselves enlightened and given new strength and courage and wisdom as we head forward in serving you. Be with us this day and every day, for we ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Inside.